part of the fall meeting. This is part of the fall meeting of the Arkansas Audubon Society. And uh, you, you should be able to see now, I've got to write, I've got to tell, got it. Okay. Um, this is what the plan is, the, this welcome and the overview of what we're going to be listening to today. A lot of this, in fact, all, all of it has been pre-recorded for a number of reasons. Uh, the first thing we're going to look at is plastics, innocent victims, and these are wildlife victims, but there's a lot of information here also about how the plastics are impacting us. And then we have a five minute book review of Talame's newest book, uh, The Nature of Oaks. And then we'll return to the topic of plastics for 15 minutes. And Dr. Root will tell us some of the things that we can do uh, to decrease our use of plastics. And then we have a short book review of a, a fiction book, Ministry for the Future. And then we'll wrap up with a bio blitz from a um, instructor, a teacher who uh, applied for a grant from the Ruth Thomas Fund at which we provided. And she was able to go out to Wyoming and attend a bio blitz. And what's interesting to me is that she has um, taken those ideas and already starting to put them to good use back here in Arkansas. So that's what's up. Next. All right, this, oh, well, this is Terry Root's presentation. Dr. Root is a uh, emeritus professor from uh, the, the University of, um, uh, what? Stanford. Stanford, yeah. And uh, she's also a Nobel Prize winning, a Peace Prize winning, uh, member. Right. I'm really, really pleased to be here today. Um, I'm talking about something that is absolutely horrific. It is a very tough talk to listen to, but please stay with me because at the end, I'm going to go through and talk about uh, the fact that we have a lot of hope because there's a lot of things that we can do. We can really make things much, much better for the innocent victims that are being affected by, by plastics, like this poor bird, this poor stork. Thank you, Jim. Um, this poor stork has to live its life looking through a plastic bag. So anyway, um, so, but if you'll just stick with me and I'll talk to you about the, the good things that we can do about plastics, because there are a lot of things but it is a horrific story. So let me talk a little bit about what I'm gonna be talking to you about tonight. <laughs> My husband is trying to get our dog. Um, I'm gonna talk first about the facts about plastics so that we understand what actually has happened. Then I'm gonna to talk to you about how wildlife is being affected by plastics. And you can see it in this, this photograph here how this poor whale is having to live its life with all of these things tied around it. And that's all plastic stuff too. Um, and then I'm gonna to talk to you about what we all must do. And there's a lot of things that we can do. Now this horror story started back in 1907 and Leo Bakelin was the first person to actually fully synthesize the plastic polymer. And he invented a thing called Bakelite. And it took about 40 years, but after about 40 years, we had quite a bit of plastic. So by 1950, we had two tons of plastic, two million, sorry, two million tons of plastic being produced. And you can see as you go up by each decade, it's going higher and higher and higher and higher and higher and higher. And higher. Um, in 2020, we had 435 million tons of plastic produced in the world. That's a lot of plastic. And now what they're projecting is for 2050, we are gonna have 1,750 million tons of plastic being produced. Holy mackerel, that's a lot of plastic. And I hope, I hope, I hope that that's, that statistic is actually wrong. We won't go that high and I'll explain to you why. 
So since 1907, we have actually created 9.2 billion tons of plastic. Since 1907, 9.2 billion tons. I have a hard time with big, big numbers like that. 9.2 billion tons. How much is 9.2 billion tons? Well, it's equivalent in weight to 25,000 Empire State Buildings. That's how much plastic we have produced over the years since 1907 when it was first discovered. 7 billion of that 9.2 billion is now waste. And that actually is, is probably a low number. Um, and that then is equivalent to 19,000 Empire State Buildings has been made into waste. And we have to understand plastic never disappears. Plastic is always around, it doesn't biodegrade. All it does is it breaks up and gets smaller and smaller and smaller. The only portions of plastic that we don't have anymore are the portions of the plastic that have been incinerated. And incineration is not a good idea. It causes a lot of pollution, a lot of harmful chemicals are released into the air. Now, the thing that is, is true about plastic is plastic comes from oil. And 6% of the world's oil production is used to make plastic, 6%. That's a very large percentage. And for one pound of plastic that is made, six pounds of CO2, which is a gas, so it doesn't weigh very much, but six pounds of CO2 goes up into the atmosphere. So if we have 9 billion tons since 1907, that means of plastic, that means we have 55.2 billion tons of CO2 going up into our atmosphere. Oh my gosh, that's a lot. That's a lot of CO2 going into the atmosphere. Okay, let's talk about this 9.2 billion tons of plastic that has ever been made. 30% is still in use. Now that's a misnomer because when it says it's still in use, we're talking about things that were probably put together in maybe 1960, and we're assuming that that's still in use. So we have a lot of plastic in cars. So that's considered to be still in use, but many of those cars aren't still in use. So it really is a misnomer. There really isn't 30% still in use. But anyway, what, what this really is talking about is 30% of the plastic that has ever been made has been made into something that was more than single use. So it was made for, for cars, for also, you, you, you know all the different things that plastic has been made for that's not single use. 8% has been incinerated. And that is really quite problematic because of all of the toxic chemicals that are put up into the atmosphere because of the incineration. Um, not, it's not good. 9% uh, has been recycled. People are always telling me, Terry, we don't need to worry about climate, uh, about plastics, because when we're, we're having plastics, I make sure that I recycle it all. Well, most of the recycling that you and I put into our recycling bins goes into the landfill. Only 9% of the plastic has ever been recycled. And 53% is in landfills or in the oceans. So that's what I wanna to talk to you about today is this huge amount of plastic that is in our landfills and in our oceans. Now, eight states have banned plastic bags. That's really good. So here are the eight states and then there's also Washington DC has actually banned, you know, I. I'm this, I just remade this slide and I'm wrong. It's 10 states, I'm sorry, there's a mistake on that. It's 10 states have actually banned plastic bags and you can see them up there. Um, New Jersey and Washington just came on board and I just remade this slide and I didn't change the eight, I apologize. But anyway, it's eight states. But guess what Florida has? 
Florida has banned the banning of plastic bags. We cannot ban plastic bags in Florida. Coral Gables, the city, Coral Gables, took this all the way to the Florida Supreme Court saying they had a right to say that they were banning plastic bags and they weren't, they lost. They lost in the Florida um, Supreme Court. So here in Florida, we cannot ban the ban, ban. We, ah, we cannot ban plastic bags at all. Now, there are 17 other states that have banned the banning of plastic bags and you can see them all here. But there are also some cities, Boston has banned plastic bags, Chicago has banned plastic bags, Colorado has banned the banning of plastic bags, but Boulder, Colorado has succeeded in banning plastic bags in some manner. And there is a county in Maryland, uh, Montgomery County, that has banned plastic bags. Um, but this is what we need to all do throughout America. We need to ban plastic bags. And in Florida, we certainly do because we're right along the ocean and so many plastic bags go into the ocean and the ocean is full of plastic bags. So now shoppers worldwide use about 5,000 billion single use plastic bags a year. That's a staggering, staggering, staggering number. About 5,000 billion single use plastic bags. About 9 million plastic bags are used each minute worldwide and annually about 625 plastic bags are used per person worldwide. That's more than two a day almost. That's a lot of plastic bags. We are really, really, really producing a lot of plastic bags that are completely useless after they've been used once. Now, Ireland was smart and came up and had put a 15 cent tax on plastic bags. And as soon as they put the tax on, the usage of plastic bags dropped by 90%. Now the average annual plastic bag usage in the US, just the US per person is 365. Basically, we all use one plastic bag a year. So that means if you multiply by how many people are in the US, that is about 122 billion bags per year. That's a lot of bags that are going into the landfill. It's ridiculous. We don't need to do that. We truly, truly don't. 122 billion bags a year going into the landfills. Ridiculous. Now, the average annual plastic bag usage in Denmark per person. Now, I haven't put a picture up there yet, but I want you all to think, what do you think the number is in Denmark? And I bet some of you will guess, but it's four. So here is a developed country. They have learned how to not use plastic bags. They use on average four bags per person a year. And on average in the US it's 365. There's something wrong here. Denmark knows what they're doing. So the total number for Denmark uses is 23.2 million bags. That's still a lot of bags, but it's a lot less than what we're doing here in America. Now let's go back to America. America purchased 346 plastic bottles per person in 2015. I'm sorry, these are old data, but that's as, as new the data as I could find. Now of that, 32 bottles were recycled. So that's 9%, 32 bottles were recycled. Of those 32 bottles that we recycled, almost uh, seven of them, uh, only 2% are actually in use. So the 9% gets recycled, but then when the recyclers are taking the bottles and making things into them, like make, taking, um, I, my husband and I have t-shirts that are made out of recycled bottles, things like that. They can't use all the bottles that they get, so they actually end up having to throw them away. So 
what really is used is 2% of the bottles that we have recycled, not really 9%. 9% is a very low number. Two is a minuscule number, but that's what is actually used. The rest goes in landfills. So the worst plastic by far is single use plastic. That includes plastic bags, plastic straws, plastic battle bottles, and plastic wrap. All of those are single use and we don't need to use them. All of us that are listening to this can do something about that and not use any of these. Now, the other thing that is of concern is microfibers. Nylon was discovered in 1939. By 1941, nylon was being used in World War II to make um, parachutes and tents and things like this, and it has just gone skyrocketing since. Microfibers are now out in the oceans, ex extensively in the oceans. That I could give a whole talk just on microfibers. Microfibers is a very, very, very bad thing. Um, and, and it comes from things like polyester and nylon and rayon, things like that. Um, but they're, they're very, very, very bad too because they're floating in the oceans. And I'll talk about that in a, in a minute. So this is what happens to plastic. So you have a plastic bag, you have a plastic bottle, you have plastic wrap, a plastic straw, it breaks down and it breaks down and it breaks down and it breaks down and it becomes microplastics eventually. But eight, about 8.8 .8 million tons of plastic are dumped in the ocean every single year. Holy mackerel, 8.8 .8 million tons are dumped into the ocean. So let's go back to my Empire State Building because that, that helps me understand what this big number of 8.8 .8 million tons actually is. Let's assume that we had 8.8 .8 million tons of Lego bricks. I have grand nieces and grand nephews that absolutely love Lego bricks. They will do anything for Lego bricks. Well, if we had 8.8 .8 million tons of Lego bricks, we could build 19, 19 life-size Empire State buildings and have some Lego bricks left over. That's how much, how much plastic is going into the ocean every single year. That's a lot of plastics. Our oceans can't survive this. It just can't. Now, where in the oceans is this? We have five gyres in the ocean currents, and a gyre just says that it just is, is making a kind of like a circle. Here you can see the Southern Pacific gyre here um, that I'm using my cursor on. The Northern Pacific gyre that is up above that is the big one. Um, and that is because it's coming from the United States and it's coming from Asia and to some extent, but not much from Australia. Um, but this is where the big area is. Um, this Northern gyre covers 600,000 square miles. That's the size of Alaska and South Carolina put together. Or if you wanna think about it a different way, take six Colorados and that makes up how big the gyre is in the North Pacific. So this North Pacific gyre is huge. The other four, there are four other gyres here. They do have plastics in them, but not nearly as many as, as in the North Pacific gyre. Microplastics, again, this is plastics that have been broken down and broken down and broken down, have been found in the Antarctic sea ice. Holy mackerel, all the way to the bottom of the, of, of the earth. And they've actually been discovered near the summit of Mount Everest in 2020. So microplastics are getting around everywhere. Plastics are everywhere. That's basically what the bottom line is. And here we have a, a cartoon, free hammocks all over the town. It's like a miracle. We have to remember what has ha happened with the pandemic and the pandemic has made things a lot worse. 
This is um, a collection of masts that were found on the shore, a uh, very, very small area shore um, that this man had collected. Now, the thing with plastics is, is that plastics have a lot of chemicals in them that are very toxic to us. Um, we have um, a lot of plastics that have gotten rid of some of those toxins. And, um, but now they're finding that the, that the chemicals that they use to replace the bad things with are almost just as bad for us. So plastics in general, if you ingest them, are very bad. The other thing that happens with plastics is they act like a sponge and they actually will absorb other chemicals. So they're absorbing DDT, DDT, C C PCBs, on and on. I don't want to read the list, but there's a lot of things that the, that the uh, plastic can have in with them. But the plastics themselves have a lot of bad chemicals also. So we're getting a double whammy when they are ingested. And in North America, the infants are being exposed to about 1 million microplastic particles a day is what the new estimate is. This is, this is very recent data. Um, it's coming from polypropylene baby bottles um, that are releasing all of this. You have to be very careful what kind of bottle you're using, what kind of cap you're using, and what kind of nipple you are actually using. Um, because all of them will be releasing microplastics. And now microplastics, there's a brand new study that just came out in January. There are microplastics that are being found in fetuses and placentas. Um, so they looked at six different placentas and found them in four. And they only looked in very rudimentary places. So they think if they had looked harder, they may have found more. But but the studies now, as I said, they're brand new studies, um, they're ongoing. And basically all of us, each one of us consumes about one credit card worth of plastic per week. We're consuming one credit card's worth of plastic a week. That's a lot of plastic going into us. And some of that plastic is very toxic. They have found plastics in plastic microparticles in livers and in kidneys. This is just an example. So it, it is there. So now where are we getting all of this microplastics, microplastics from? Well, there was a study that was done on sea salt and they collected sea salt from all over the United States and they tested it to see if it had microplastics in it. And they didn't have to do any statistics on it at all because 100% of the sea salt that they tested from all over the US had microplastics in it. I had a woman who said, that can't be true. I, I buy very, very expensive sea salt. And I said, well, it is true. And she said, I just don't believe you. About four days after my talk, I got an email from her and she said, you made me so mad. I went home and I put my salt in a, in a bowl and I put water in it and I melted all the salt and I looked down and yeah, you're right. There were microplastics at the bottom of the bowl after all the salt had melted away. So from now on, please, 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 no more sea salt. It is really, really bad for you. So you don't want to get the microplastics in it. Another place that we're getting plastics is you need to avoid these very expensive tea bags, PET tea <coughs> bags. You put them in hot water and all the chemicals from the plastics come out and the microplastics come out. So literally it says in the study, it said literally billions of microplastic particles come out from these tea bags. So don't use nylon tea bags. And this brings up the fact that we have to worry about micro, um, microfibers. And the microfibers are floating around in the ocean and where they come from is from our, our washing machines. 
when we dry clothes, we actually have lint traps and we trap the lint. In our washing machines, we don't have those traps. And so when we're washing, all of that, those microfibers go out into the water stream and that gets out into our oceans. And we have got micro, um, uh, microfibers floating around in the oceans. Um, they're actually more numerous than the microplastic particles are. And so that means we need to all be thinking twice about eating filter feeders, things like oysters, clams, sardines, things like that that are filter that are filter feeders. They are getting these microfibers into their bodies. When we eat them, they are coming into our bodies, and that is not a good thing to have happen. And then we have to also talk about the, the fishing equipment that is lost or abandoned um, annually. There's 640,000 tons of it. And our wildlife gets, gets caught up in it. Um, we've got to find a better way to regulate so that there is no lost equipment or abandoned equipment. There is good news. There are um, enzymes out there that can actually eat plastics. Um, I don't know how good this is. I tried to follow up on this study and I couldn't find any follow up. So this is all I know about it at the time. So now let's talk specifically about wildlife and plastics. There are five different marine animals that are affected the most. First are sea turtles, sea, seals and sea lions seabirds, fish, and cetaceans, the whales and the dolphins. Now, you may see the difference here, but a turtle doesn't. So a turtle will see a plastic bag floating in the ocean, and there are billions of them floating in the ocean. And what do they do? They ingest them. So it is assumed that at least 50% of all sea turtles have ingested plastics, mainly from plastic bags. 15% of loggerhead sea turtle young die due to ingesting plastic. The loggerhead sea turtle is an endangered species. We can't afford to lose 15% of the young due to plastics. They're going to go extinct. That's not, that's not a, an if, it's, it's probably a when they will go extinct. Here we have seals getting tangled in fishing um, nets. Seals are very, very playful. Actually, this is a sea lion. Um, they're very playful. They like to play with things and then it gets stuck around their neck. And now this poor sea lion is gonna have to live the rest of its life like that, unless a human can come along and help cut it off. And that's a hard thing to do. And you can see how a lot of these, these circular things have gotten around these lion's nicks and their skin has grown all over them. It's very, very painful. They can chafe, they can bleed, that can cause infection, which can cause death. It's estimated that 90%, 90% of all seabirds have eaten plastic. And we know that 98% of the albatrosses that have been studied have actually ingested plastic. And Chris Jordan, who is a, a, a videographer, went to Midway to actually, Midway Island, to actually film the albatrosses and, and their having their reproduction, having their chicks. He didn't expect to find this all over that island. This is a carcass of a young albatross. The parent has been dutifully feeding it plastics. So the, the chick has died a very, very, very painful death of starvation, even though the parents have been very, very careful about feeding it. They just didn't realize they were feeding it plastic and it has killed killed the chick, and now these chicks have littered 
the area around um, Midway Island. And if you have a chance, I know it sounds very gruesome, but it's a very beautiful movie. Um, Chris's movie, Chris Jordan's movie, Midway, Message from the Gyre, is a very powerful and very, very beautiful movie. Um, I recommend it to you if you can find it. And we really have to be concerned about albatrosses because albatross populations are dropping. They're plummeting in abundance. And I'm sure that there are going to be, I'm 66 years old. No, I'm not. I'm 67 years old. I am sure there are going to be extinctions of albatrosses um, before I die, unless I get hit by a semi-truck tomorrow. Um, Albatrosses are not doing well. And what's happening is they are feeding their chicks the plastics. They are feeding themselves the plastics and they are dying. Now, as far as fish go, 12,000 to 24,000 tons of plastic is ingested by fish just in the North Pacific each year. Here's a, an, a poor fish that has again gotten trapped by one of these circular things and it's gonna to have to live its life with a circular band around it. Two thirds of our fish stocks have plastics in them. That prompted this comic, this uh, cartoon. May I have a plastic bag already inside? I wish it were funny. If it weren't true, it would be funny. Um, now about cetaceans, 100% of the sperm whales, whales that have been necropsied. Um, that's the term that they use for, aut we use aut aut autopsies um, because we're doing it on ourselves, on, on humans. A human dissecting a human is an autopsy. A human dissecting another species is a necropsy, but 100% of the sperm whales that have been necropsied have plastic bags in their stomachs. And I think it was last year or the year before that, a beautiful male sperm whale uh, washed up on the shore somewhere in Europe, um, Ireland, I think, I don't remember where. Um, and it had 220 pounds of plastic bags in its stomach. That's a lot of plastic bags to have been eating and thinking that it was getting nutrients and it's not. This is from the Clearwater Aquarium. The, um, the dolphins in the Gulf of Tam Tampa Gulf, Tampa Bay Gulf, Tampa Bay um, have been studied for 40 years. And this is a young dolphin. And the mother knew that the, the young dolphin was in trouble. So it came to, it brought the baby to the aquarium and waited until it saw somebody that it knew, it started making a ruckus, that person went out, looked at what was going on. They put up a boundary to keep the mother, here's the boundary, the net in the back, keep the mother and the baby in the area. So some um, people went out and held the mom, they took the baby and untangled the baby and released the baby. So there are success stories like this, not many, but there are success stories like this. Now, there are also animals that are being affected that are not marine animals. This is a coastal animal. This is a black oyster catcher that got plastic on its bill and it could no longer feed. So it too starved. And those damn stupid six pack holders, we gotta do something about. Here's a turtle got stuck in one of these and it has been able to live its life. It has an hourglass figure now. Um, but anyway, it couldn't break through this and it had to live its life that way. That's a hard thing to do. So anytime, please, anytime you have something that is circular, each one of these, each one of these holes, this one, the little one, the big one, the one that holds the can, all of them need to be cut open before you throw anything away. Anything that is circular, please cut it open. This is of a wolf in um, India, and they don't have guns to dart things with and put them down so that they can put them to sleep and then take care of them. 
but this there's a this is a success story this was a wolf that was in india it was so weak from not being able to eat um, that a bunch of rangers went in and tackled it literally tackled it and pulled the the jar off of its head released it had no idea if it was strong enough to eat but it was strong enough to eat and they did later find it that it was still surviving so there are surviving cases but even on land we have animals that are being hurt by plastics and then again this tangling that goes on okay so now what we all must do this is an unsung hero i uh intentionally this was in three parts and i intentionally uh, covered the first two and we'll come back to uh, Dr. Root's uh, 15 minutes of suggestions on what we can do. Um, but I thought maybe a little break would give us a chance to think about what we just uh, heard and saw. This is a sign, by the way, that uh, we saw in Costa Rica in the entrance to a rainforest. A savage is not the one who lives in the forest, but the one who destroy it. Next, we've got a book review from Pam Stewart. Uh, don't need to introduce her too much, I think, from the, knowing the people who are on this. Uh, anyway, Pam is a driving force behind the uh, Arkansas Audubon Society Bird Friendly Yard Certification Program. And uh, she's very interested in the work of Douglas Talame. Take it away, Pam. This is the nature of oaks, the rich ecology of our most essential native trees by Douglas Talame, my review of the book. In July of 20,000, Douglas Talame and his wife purchased land in eastern Pennsylvania for a new home. After clearing a former hayfield of invasive multiflora rose, autumn olive, and Japanese honeysuckle, they planted a white oak tree. No other oaks grew within a mile of the property. Thus, their surprise the following spring to find oak seedlings appearing in patches of soil left bare from the invasive plant removal. This is the first of many mysteries with which Talame peppers his writing to pique the interest of the readers. You may know of Doug Talame as the entomologist who wrote Bringing Nature Home and thus wonder why he has chosen to write about trees, oak trees. I can tell you after reading this book, oaks support 897 species of moths, 33 species of butterflies in the United States, enough to keep an entomologist happy. But that isn't all. More than 2,300 species, including other insects or invertebrates, Birds, mammals, and fungi make use of oak trees, and of these, 326 species are completely dependent on oaks for some part of their life. As the connections among species and oaks are described, Talame draws the reader in so that one feels like a fellow researcher solving one puzzle after another. For instance, those many oaks that sprouted in the former hayfield a photo of a blue jay in flight with an acorn held in its beak reminded Talame that the jay family is known for caching nuts. And what better place than freshly churned soil? Remembering where up to 4,500 acorns are cached is beyond a blue jay's memory. So oak trees are planted by blue jays, while jays benefit from a winter store of protein. Each chapter in the book is a month in the life of an oak, beginning with October as acorns ripen. There is the mystery of why boom and bust acorn years occur and why some oak species hold on to their dead leaves for so long. November is a feeding frenzy with many animals relying on oaks for their winter protein. In one chain of events, the female of a curculio weevil lays an egg in an acorn, the larva feeding on the nut meat during the winter, and in spring, leaving an empty shell perfect in size for a colony of tiny ants to inhabit until after another ant colony arrives 
and enslaves the first. He describes the yellow-vested moth as a dapper little guy. However, scientific names, sorry, and information are presented so that scientist, teacher, or tree hugger all have reason to read and be amazed and enjoy. In midwinter, kinglets, chickadees, and even owls have been found with stomachs full of caterpillars. Another mystery, the answer, of course, having to do with oaks. Springtime in North America offers tender, fresh foliage and emerging insects make migration's long, dangerous flight worth the risk. Birds arrive at exactly the right time to find insects on tender, fresh spring growth. Insects that can be turned into baby food and oak trees providing the majority of them. Ptolemy reports on the many connections that exist among oaks, other species, including ourselves. The shade and transpiration of large trees moderate climate, making homes more comfortable. Oak leaf litter protects soil, slows rainwater runoff, providing insects with cover during various life stages. The long-lived trees and deep roots store carbon and promote mycorrhizal fungi relationships, which result in carbon deposits stored for hundreds to even thousands of years. There are questions as to how oaks have become so important that they are regarded as a keystone species, supporting more forms of life and more fascinating interactions than any other tree genus in North America. They have an ancient history and are widely spread around the world, thus providing time and opportunity for evolutionary adaptations to occur. However, other trees also have ancient histories, but none have been found to support anywhere near the number of caterpillars as the oak group. Whether your interest is in oaks, birds, insects, or nature generally, you will find this book fun and informative, a good read. The reference section contains suggestions for the species of oak a homeowner might want to plant, depending on the property, and directions for how to plant oak trees. Thank you. <laughs> I love that. Would. I'm going to watch everyone it again else, sometime. I think it's, everyone else will think it's weird. <laughs> Are we still? Can they still hear mm -hmm. us talking? Oh. <laughs> All right. As promised, we'll return now to uh, Dr. Root's uh, suggestions on how we can avoid plastics. And even though Pam and I try to avoid plastic use, we picked up some other ideas from listening to, to this 15 minute presentation. I did forget to mention that Dr. Root was one of the lead authors in several of the early intergovernor governmental panel on climate change, the IPCC reports. Her specialty is, uh, is wildlife. Uh, so um, she's got quite a resume. So let's hear what she has to say. So now let's talk about what you and I can do. No plastic shopping bags ever, 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 ever again should touch your hand. It's easy to do. You can use cloth bags. If you have to, you can use paper, but please try to use cloth bags. It's easy to do. You might forget them in your car. My husband, my husband had a hard time remembering to take his bags in. And he'd be halfway through shopping and he'd say, oh, nuts, I forgot the bags in the car. And he went out and got them. He says it only took three times for him to finally train himself that every time he goes to the grocery store, he he's first stops, gets the, plat, the um, cloth bags out of the trunk and goes into the grocery store. No plastic fruit or veggie bags, the produce bags that are around um, that, that you put all of your apples in or that you put something else in, you don't need to use their plastic bags. You can use cloth bags, small cloth bags you can buy specifically for that, or you can reuse the same plastic bag over and over and over again. That's actually what I do. I don't have cloth bags for this. I just have, have use the same plastic bag over and over and over. So when I put my cloth bags in the car, I put my plastic 
the plastic bags that carry the fruit and produce inside the cloth bags. And so when I get to the store, I will have my own bag and I will not use their plastic bags. It's still using plastic bags, but it's using it over and over and over again. No plastic drinking bottles. There is absolutely no reason that we, any of us, should be drinking water out of plastic bottles. Actually, they did a study and 93% of the water in plastic bottles had microplastics in them. So for that reason, don't use, don't use plastic bottles. You don't need to. It's easy. You can use metal reusable bottles and you can fill them up at drinking fountains or at sinks. They're easy to do, just do it. No other types of plastic bottles. You have a choice. You don't need to buy milk in a plastic bottle or orange juice in a plastic bottle or even Tide or OxyClean in a plastic bottle. So you can use orange juice and milk in paper cartons. You can do that. Um, and you don't need to use detergent bottles at all. You can use a thing that comes from True Earth. You can order it from Amazon if you want, uh, want to. It is actually sheets of detergent. And I use it all the time. It comes in a probably six inches by eight inch envelope. And there are sheets of uh, detergent. And I, you just tear one off and you put it in. For OxyClean, you can use boxes. You can use the old fashioned boxes. They still exist. You just have to use them. I get mine at Costco. No straws. We all can do this. It's easy to do. We just have to remember. You have to tell your server when you first get sit down, please no straws. Um, you can use your own straw if you want to. I just don't use straws anymore at all. No plastic wrap. We don't have to use plastic wrap. There's all sorts of other things to do. You can use silicone bags, you can use dish covers, and you can use waxed cloth. So here's an example of the silicone bags. You can get them at Target. I, I personally love, this is called a zip top. It's made out of silicone. I can put it in the oven. I can put it in the freezer. I can wash it easily. It opens up nicely. They're fabulous. Um, I don't like these as well because they're a little bit harder to open, uh, but they're smaller and you can take them for lunch and that, that might work better for you. But you can have dish covers. If you don't want this kind of dish cover, you can buy dish covers at Publix. I just saw one at Publix. They are made out of plastic, but the point is, is you use them for years. So you use them over and over. I actually have cloth ones that are made out of polished cotton and they're easy to keep clean. They are wonderful. Here's a silicone um, top that you actually put on pans. I personally don't like these because it takes up so much room in the, in the refrigerator. I don't, I don't use those. What I do use a lot of is wax cloth. And these are pieces of cloth that have wax in it, beeswax in them. And when they're um, not super cold, you just fold it over and it clings to the bowl itself. It's wonderful. Now, the only problem is, is that when it's cold, it doesn't work. So if I have one that's cold and I wanna put it back on the bowl, I just put it in the microwave. I nuke it for literally three seconds. It warms it up enough. I can put it back on. It works wonderfully. I got the ones that I have from a company called ETTE, -E 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 -E. um, if you go to, if you have someone who go, goes to Trader Joe's, Trader Joe's has them. I'm sure there are others. Um, they're sold through, let's see, uh, National Wildlife Federation. That's where I got this picture from, was the National Wildlife Federation. They sell them. Something that is an absolute no-no, no more styrofoam, no more styrofoam, anything, no cups, no plates, no egg cartons, meat, meat cartons, doggy bag containers. Styrofoam is absolutely god awful. 
So you can just choose other forms of cups, other forms of plates. You can get other kinds of egg cartons. They don't have to be plastic. They don't have to be styrofoam. They can be made out of paper. We can all do this. When you go to buy meat, make sure you turn it over and make sure you're not buying something in styrofoam. At Costco, they sell their uh, wild caught salmon on styrofoam containers. And so I just cannot buy my, oh, my wild caught salmon at Costco because of the container that they're in. And when you go out to eat, you know what? You can take your own doggy bags. It's a pain, but you can do it. You really can. No one use plastic sandwich bags. The zip top bags, don't use it just once. Wash it out and use it time and time again, or better yet, use wax paper bags, or these, again, these resealable, resealable and reusable uh, silicone bags. They work beautifully. Now, microfibers. Microfibers are a real problem, and they come off of dryer sheets. And so try, please don't use microfiber dryer sheets. Myers, Mrs. Myers sells paper. See, paper sheets. They work beautifully. I love them. But then my uh, stepson turned me on to using dryer balls, and they're fabulous. So you use wool dryer balls. You can get them um, online easily. Again, trade. I know you don't have Trader Joe's there, but um, Trader Joe's also sells them too. Um, they work perfectly, and that's what I use now all the time. Our wool dryer dryer balls, and they're fabulous. Yeah, now, the other thing is buy clothing and bedding that is made from cotton, linen, hemp, not microfibers such as nylon, rayon, and polyester, because when you wash them, the microfibers go off into the oceans and we are swimming in microfibers. The other thing is, is wash items only as often as they need to be washed. Don't wash something just because it's, it's sitting somewhere and you just have forgotten about it. You really need to wash items only when they need to be washed. And it's, this is easy to do, we just have to do it. So here in Florida, it's much nicer to be dressed in cotton and linen and hemp rather than in nylon, rayon, or polyester, particularly in the summertime, for goodness sakes. So please, please try to wean yourself away from polyester. It really, polyester, rayon, and nylon, it, it can be done. Then the other thing too is cut anything circular, anything circular, cut it open. And this goes for the handles of dog of uh, garbage bags. This also goes for your ear loops on the masks that are disposable for that we're using right now. Anything that is circular, please cut it open. Because what we're doing is we're really harming the innocent victims out there. And this is an example of a poor seal that is being harmed by a circular something that it got around it. And you can see now here where it's bleeding and it could easily, very easily get infected and die. This one's lucky because it was helped by a human and that human now can cut this open and release it. But think of all the ones that are out there that can't be released. So we cause the problem, we can fix the problem. We just have to get off of our duffs and do it. So thank you very, very much for listening. Here's my information, um, how you can get in touch with me if you would like to. So I really do appreciate you sharing your evening with me. Let me stop sharing here. There we go. Now I'm back. Thanks. I'm glad you got to see Terry there at the end. Um, she would have done this live, but I uh, 
hated to ask her to do that because she's I know she's very busy. I don't know why this screen is dark or white, but ah, this is a very brief mention of a we had a uh, nonfiction book. This is a brief mention of a fiction book, Ministry for the Future. It actually is not very far into the future. It uh, takes place in 2035, so uh, right down the road. And it deals with the climate change issue. Uh, it is fiction, but it's there's so much good science in it. It's a little bit of a difficult read, but I think it's well worth the effort. We almost gave up on it, and we're so glad we did uh, finish. Kim Stanley Robinson is a well-known science fiction writer. It is not character-driven. Uh, there are some characters that you begin to care a little bit about, but uh, that's not the focus of this. This is how the world deals with climate change, and it begins with a horrendous heat wave in Uttar Pradesh, India. Um, this is a state along the border with Nepal. And it's often hot there, but this time the heat in this in this uh, fictionalized version stays for weeks on end and then intensifies. And night brings no relief. There's a young American aid worker there called Frank May. He does what he can to help inviting his neighbors into the air conditioning offices to cool themselves. And then the power goes out. Then the agency's generator and window units are stolen by a gang of armed young men. Uh, the heat kills millions of people. And that's the beginning of the book. And surprisingly, uh, you, uh, Frank's part of this fades in and out of the story. And we also are introduced to Mary Murphy, who was made the director of the ministry for the future and all the nations got together to create this ministry after their frustration for the lack of progress on the Paris climate uh, initiative. So that's the setup for this. And as I said, there's a lot of science in it. Um, uh, well, worth, well worth the time to read it. It is 500 some pages long, uh, but it keeps, as I, hear things happening in the news, I keep thinking, oh yes, he predicted that in the ministry for the future. So anyway, that's our nonfiction, our fiction book uh, recommendation. The last thing we're going to do is, uh, I and mean, this is not the last, but the least by any means, uh, Amber Cobb is a, a teacher and a education leader here in Arkansas, and she applied for a Ruth Thomas Fund grant, which we are so glad that we were able to help her attend a Wyoming bio blitz. And we really hit the jackpot when we uh, uh, helped uh, Amber attend this uh, bio blitz. As you'll see, she's already uh, putting together uh, the information that she learned from there to help students here in Arkansas. And I'm going to let her describe uh, what her occupation is and what her ideas are. Hey. My name is Amber Cobb, and I am a science specialist at the Guy Finner Co-op and Branch. Back in June, I requested or reached out to Audubon board members asking about a scholarship opportunity that would enable me to attend a bio blitz in Wyoming. And so um, as part of that scholarship opportunity that I was awarded, I was asked to present on my experience at the Wyoming Bio Blitz. So first of all, um, I do wanna tell you about my experience, but for those of you that might not be familiar with a Bio Blitz, it is basically uh, an organized event that the end goal is for scientists, community members, students, teachers, parents to all come together to survey a designated space 
to find out what kinds of animals, what kinds of birds, plants, insects, all different types of wildlife that are in a certain area. And then also scientists can use that data to determine the health of the ecosystem. Um, but then also it is a great educational opportunity for the participants. And it was especially a great opportunity for me to learn more about how a bio blitz actually happens, but then also just the content knowledge that I learned about all those different areas of wildlife really helped me grow as an educator. So this is a schedule or the schedule that was given to us prior to the bio blitz. As you can see, it was super packed with lots of engaging opportunities. This year was the first year that they added a day on Friday, which was actually before the bio blitz. And they called this the pre bio blitz. And it was workshops that gave you a little bit more background information on the types of things that you might see out in the field. And so the ones that I attended were the ones on botany and insects. And so they basically just gave us some taxonomy information so that we could identify some of the things that we might see uh, on Saturday. So the pre bio blitz workshops, we got to meet uh, with professors and doctors who studied various insects. And so they gave us general information, some handouts, some identifying characteristics of the different uh, big general insects that we might see. So the families um, that we might see uh, when we were out in the field. And so here, whoa, here's a picture of me. I'm gonna see if I can go back here. There we go. Here's a picture of me. Uh, we got the opportunity to go and use some nets to gather some potential specimen. And then we were able to look at those underneath the microscope and compare them to the handouts that they gave us and try to identify what they were. And so I learned a lot about that. Insects are not really my thing, but I can tell you that I was engaged and I really appreciated the opportunity to get to learn more about um, that, that, that area. We also were able to uh, take workshops on botany and the different identifying characteristics of families of plants. And then finally, we were able to learn about the iNaturalist app, which I think is a phenomenal um, resource for anybody that's wanting just to learn more about nature, but then also during a bio blitz. And so basically it's an app that you uh, download on your phone and you take a picture of whatever the plant, the animal, the insect is that you're wanting to record. And then you upload it and share it to iNaturalist. And then for example, in the works or in the bio blitz that we had, we would add it to the group Wyoming bio blitz. And at the end, the app would categorize and convert over to different charts and visuals so that the participants and the people that were analyzing all of the data could get a picture of the types of wildlife that we saw at the end of it. So it's basically just taking like a paper version and turning it into an app version that is um, that you're able to look at a lot quicker. There's also a companion app called Seek, where in my case, students or teachers could identify or look at a certain plant, take a picture of it, and then that app would search its database and help you identify what that specific item was um, in nature. So now let's talk about um, the experience of the bio blitz. So we rotated through four different stations and each station was more than just looking at or looking for 
this specific animal or insect or bird. Um, we actually rotated through stations. And when we got to that station, there was a scientist um, who specialized in that area that talked to us about more specific characteristics for that particular area. And then we almost got like a, a mentor as we looked around and tried to identify it. And so one of the stations was birds. And so here you see, I took a picture of some cliff swallows that made their nest up in uh, the roof of um, a building that was there. Another station that we went to was on mammals. And so a, a, a young lady who actually has her doctorate degree or is working towards her doctorate degree in mammal studies, she talked to us about how we could look in nature and find um, clues that there might be um, a certain type of mammal there. And so one of the things that we noticed, which I am not a hunter, um, she kind of took us just for a walk around just this one, maybe 100 foot area. And she showed us identifying characteristics that, yeah, there were deer that actually um, are here and in this area. And so we looked at imprints in the grass, we looked at hoof prints, we looked at um, some markings on trees. And so to um, maybe a lay person, you might walk by all of those signals and not really know what you're looking at. But with her training, we were able to identify things that are pretty obvious if you're looking for that. Out of all the stations, I think that was probably one of my top favorite ones, um, just because um, I love to look at deer and raccoons and different animals like that. And it's really cool um, that I might be able to go and sit maybe in a plot of land around my house and know if there was a certain type of animal that was there. The next station that we went to was a macro invertebrate station. And so there was a representative from the Wyoming Environmental Association who actually goes out into the field and studies the health of the different water sources in Wyoming. And so we collected or looked for clues that macro invertebrates were actually in the water system. And then we compared that to a chart that let us know these are the types of macro invertebrates that can tolerate pollution or that can't tolerate pollution. And we were able to determine the water quality of that water system um, at the Britain Museum. The next station that we went to or that my group went to was a fish shocking station. And so um, it it's did um, where we had some biologists who had shocking equipment that basically just stun the fish. And you can, once the fish are stunned, you can collect them and then get a weight, um, identify maybe some characteristics if they're male or female, and then record that on a chart. And then it kind of lets you know as a scientist some trends of what types of fish are in the water during certain times. Should we be expecting more of this population or less of this population? And if there's any changes in that, what might be the cause and do we need to do some interventions to help kind of reset that ecosystem. And then finally, uh, this was a carryover of one of our pre-sessions where we walked along, um, it was probably about a mile or a two mile trail and a botanist um, took us through the trail and talked about some of the bigger families of plants. So for example, um, I learned that a lot of plants that are in the rose family all have leaves that kind of have that perforated jagged edge. And then they have flowers that bloom out of almost like a teacup type structure. And so if you look or if you're if you find a plant that kind of have 
those characteristics, chances are it's a member of the Rose family. I also learned that you, can, especially when you're identifying insects or plants, you can't always look at just one identifying characteristic. It's the combination of multiples that let you know, yes, this belongs in this family or no, it does not. And so I really enjoyed that learning experience as well. And then this is just a picture that we, um, one of our night, our night optional sessions was we went around the campus at the Brighton Museum uh, looking for different types of reptiles and amphibians. And so we did find, I think this was a bull snake. Um, we were also able to go, which I didn't get a picture of it because it was a really wet environment, but we also went to a local pond and were able to find leopard frogs. And we were looking for some um, grass snakes, but we couldn't find those. But this was a, a win for us because we weren't expecting to be able to find any snakes um, in that area. So that uh, is essentially the bio blitz in a nutshell, but even though I learned a tremendous amount through that experience, just the location of the bio blitz was extraordinary. It was located at the Brighton Museum and the Brighton Museum is in the foothills of the Bighorn Mountains. And it is a museum that has, um, a lot of Native American history inside that are rare artifacts that may not be found anywhere else uh, in the United States. And so a lot of the Native American artifacts are from some of the names that we might have heard of uh, just throughout our, our, our lifetimes. And so we have Touch the Clouds, we have Sitting Bull and Crazy Horse. They're all pretty well-known names in the Native American community, but then also in the United States. And so just being in an area where their history is so rich and in the area where they were located, it was just a kind of a, a really um, special moment for me. Um, because I have a lot of respect for the Native American community, but it's just a really interesting aspect of our history. And so some of the things that were in that museum are some articles of clothing that were actually worn by members of the tribes of the Lakotas and the Blackfeet. And so they had lots of artifacts that you could look through that were just really mind boggling. And so finally, I wanted to share with you what my takeaways are from that experience. So not only did I learn a whole lot just for my personal growth professionally, but I also want to take the information that I used and pay it forward in the field that I work in. And so I work at the Guy Fenner Education Service Cooperative, and we do a lot of outreach to area schools. And so we provide professional development for teachers and state initiatives, but then we also do activities with students and teachers that help kids do science. So they don't necessarily just learn about science in a book, but they're involved in activities and programs that help them do and contribute to science. And so my partner and I, we kind of brainstormed, what can we do to um, extend your experience at the BioBlitz into something bigger that grows um, and really uh, impacts the schools in our area. And so just by that one experience of the BioBlitz, we thought, you know what, we want to do um, an e-STEM program, which is an environmental education program through our co-op. And the goals of that are to assist students in developing outdoor environmental skills and experiences, to introduce students to outdoor educational opportunities, to foster an appreciation and responsibility for the natural environment, to enable perspectives on con contemporary living and human to nature relationships, 
and to educate students and community members on native plants and wildlife. And so through that program that was inspired just by the BioBlitz experience that I had, we hope to um, meet these goals. And so here are the ways that we plan to do that. We want to organize a bio blitz for area school districts and community members, and we hope to partner with Mount Magazine State Park, local universities, the Arkansas Audubon Society, and the Arkansas Game and Fish Commission to be able to do that. We also hope to facilitate outdoor educational programs like field trips to the local nature center and outreach opportunities uh, for school districts like taking field trips to local state parks. We want students to create pamphlets or smartphone apps that are um, that community members can access and look at that inform them on the native plants and wildlife that they find when they did the bio blitz. And then finally, we want to provide professional development opportunities for teachers in the area of environmental science uh, so that they can if they wanted to organize a bio blitz, but also just continue the e-STEM program in their schools. I especially wanna thank you for the opportunity to go to the Wyoming bio blitz. And I hope that you see uh, through this presentation that I don't want it to be something that just stopped with that one experience that your contribution um, allowed me to learn about Wyoming, learn about its culture, and learn about the BioBlitz, but then it also inspired me to take that opportunity and pay it forward. And so thank you uh, for that opportunity, and I hope that we'll be able to work on future projects that impact schools. That was excellent. That was excellent. Uh, we're so uh, pleased with the Having met Amber, and I um, hope you all realize it as Arkansas Audubon Society members that, that uh, you had a part in that. I'm sure that Ruth Thomas would have been pleased to, to have uh, taken uh, to help that project as well. Um, we're just about finished here. I uh, want to thank Dan Scheiman for his technical assistance and the Newton County Public Library for uh, allowing us to use their facility after hours. The only problem is they shut the heat off, so it's a little chilly in here. Uh, and I'd like to remind you that the um, seven o'clock is the evening program for the Arkansas Audubon Society. Uh, the same way you got in to hear this, you, know, you can get to hear the natural state. Wild Man Wilson is giving his presentation at seven o'clock and at 8, 10, there will be uh, the Arkansas Audubon Society business meeting, which is scheduled to only be 10 minutes. Um, these bio bags, by the way, are something that Pam and I have started using that are just great. They really do disintegrate. You have to use them within a year. Um, these are just some other suggestions based on Terry Root's uh, thoughts on how to avoid plastic. Well, let's see. Oh, uh, if you have any thoughts, if you'd like to get a list of some of the products that were mentioned, we don't get any money out of this, uh, send a message to fellowship of the wings at gmail.com and I can send you uh, the names of those products that Terry mentioned as well as some others. So again, thanks for tuning in. <laughs>